Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. This is an Instapod version of the Josh Marshall Podcast, one of our special editions because of uh, breaking news events. And we're going to get into uh, what happened on Capitol Hill, uh, second half of this week, where uh, the House uh, GOP majority under Kevin McCarthy, you know, passed this budget-ish bill. Uh, since we're going to move fast today, I want to just just quickly note at the at the top that the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee, uh, greatest stuff uh, you'll ever drink, and you can get twenty five percent off Grady's at Grady's Cold Brew dot com with promo code TPM. That's Grady's Cold Brew dot com with promo code TPM. Okay, so as you know, as you know, and and as some of our colleagues in the uh, the big prestige publications don't quite seem to grasp that what is happening right now is Kevin McCarthy and the House Republican majority is trying to take the national budget, the FISC, the Treasury hostage and say, if you don't do the things we demand, we will force the country into bankruptcy. And we will do that by not allowing you to pay for the things that Congress has already bought. So Congress passed a law saying, Joe Biden, you must buy this, that, and the other. And now, uh, and so so that wasn't advice, that Joe Biden has to do that. And uh, so, and now Congress is saying, we will not pay, we will not give you the money to do the things that we already told you, you have to do, unless you give in to all of our demands. And if you don't, we will we will force the country into bankruptcy. And uh, in addition to national bankruptcy not being great, obviously, this has all sorts of knock on effects in the domestic and international economy and so on and so forth. So um, one of the things, you know, uh, President Biden's main response to all this has been, no, I'm not going to negotiate with you about whether or not you are going to force the country into bankruptcy. And I certainly am not going to uh, negotiate with you if you're not even saying what you want. Like, what are your demands? You know, the, the, it's it's sort of like if you imagine um, the bank robbers come into the bank and the police, you know, the police around the bank and, and, and they take the they take the people hostage and the police are saying, all right, what are your demands? They're saying, well, hold on. Don't don't. Don't try to pressure me. I'll, I'll, you got to give us time to come up with our demands. Okay, so that's the demands. And and in essence, to come up with what their demands were, the Republicans had to pass a, a budget bill kind of saying, this is what we want the budget to be. This, this incorporates our demands. And that is what happened on Capitol Hill this week. There was a lot of question uh, whether McCarthy would actually be able to get a bill passed because, again, they have only a four seat majority or four seats, uh, four votes to spare. And they need to uh, accommodate both the hard right Freedom Caucus people and the people who actually have to run and win elections and get them all together. Surprisingly, they did that after about a day's work. So our co-host, my co-host, Kate Riga, was up there with uh, one of her TPM colleagues covering all that and how it all went down. So, Kate, what, what happened up there? You were up there. You, you, you soaked in the vibes. What's the story? Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny because this issue in particular, the debt ceiling, I think, is the covered the worst by like the kind of mainstream slash beltway publications, which is, you know, saying something. We do a lot of media criticism on the show, but this one is so bad because it combines so many things that they can't help uh, or that they don't want to not cover as like horse racy and sports like and exciting and everything. So, you know, being up there Wednesday, this is the day that they ultimately passed the bill. And it was hours of the Republican leadership trying to win over you know, the, the handful of undecideds. So I was outside the speakership suite for hours, just kind of watching, you know, Nancy Mace come in, come out, Timber Chet come in, come out, um, fast food come in, come out. And it was just like, you know, hours. And there's no and representative fast food. That was a, exactly. that was a reference to calling in pizza. Got it. Precisely. Okay. Um, yeah. And also Ronald McDonald in the flesh was hanging around that day. So I don't know. It's a That's wild weird. ride okay. at the Capitol. Yep. But um, 
so it was like all this drama mounting for them to pass this bill and, you know, being covered in this horse racy way of, of hours by hours positioning and repositioning of like, you know, where's Rick Perry? Where's, where's Chip Roy? You know, there's a handful of Midwesterners who are, if you can believe it, were holdouts because the bill would have repealed parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, including an ethanol tax credit that they wanted, which if we remember, not a single Republican voted for the Inflation Reduction Act. So they were going to vote down this bill because a tax credit would have been repealed that they voted against originally. So I, it's just... But, you know, it, it doesn't matter, right? The policies in the bill fundamentally don't matter. They're interesting in that they give us an insight into what a Republican fantasy piece of legislation looks like because no part of it had to be moderated or watered down to pass the Senate because that's not what it's for. You know, it's just this, like you say, the rhetorical tool to help Republicans say, despite the fact that we are the only ones considering not raising or extending the debt ceiling, uh, Democrats are the ones who are being financially irresponsible because they won't come to the table and negotiate with our fantasy football lineup of policies that we would pass if we were authoritarian leaders, which are absolutely dead on arrival in the Senate. I thought I saw in 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 one of your reports that um, Nancy Mace, who is you know kind of notional moderate from South Carolina, although I think that's in some question, uh, coming out of the speaker's office and saying kind of, something to the effect of, "Well, obviously I don't support most of the things in this bill, but we're you know this is going to move it to the next state, you know, to the next step. So good to go." So a lot of these people who were on board with this bill were saying openly in the process of voting for it yeah mostly you know there's tons of stuff in here that i can never support but it's for you know for this for this hybrid purpose on you know upward and onward Right. Yeah. And you have this woman, you know, Jennifer Higgins, who's kind of one of the frontline Republicans who represents a district in Virginia, who this bill would do direct, you know, disaster to her district because there's a lot of clean energy stuff going on there that the IRA kind of funded, you know. Um, and so she like gave this whole speech about how exactly like you say, she doesn't she doesn't support taking away those things, blah, blah, blah. But it's all premised on the idea that this is never going to become law. So it's, but it is still this weird kind of throwing out of the old way of operating in Congress, which is you don't make your vulnerable members take hard votes for no reason, right? Like this is just going to become attack ad fodder and they know it'll never ever become law. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I guess they are the reason they are saying these things and giving these speeches is precisely so they can say, well, I voted for it, but that doesn't mean I supported it. Right. And I'm not sure that <laughs> uh, uh, Democrats are often too lenient with special pleading, but I think they've toughened up a little in mm -hmm. a campaign context in recent years. So I don't think that's going to cut it. And if anything, it's in some ways, it is almost worse to say Nancy May says she doesn't support it, but she voted for it. But, you know, it, 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 it's it's a it, it is a real and worse version of, you know, was for it before she was against it or whatever that exactly, old, you know, John Kerry hit was. OK, so continue. I just pardon my right. interruption. So that was just how the day went. It was an hour by hour recalculating of who the no votes were as if this was a piece of legislation that would actually, you know, change anybody's life at all. Uh, it goes to the floor. It passes by the barest of margins. And then, you know, we're all kind of waiting for McCarthy to come out and take his victory lap. And oh boy, did he just crowing like he came out in this really belligerent stance he wanted to yell at reporters like for a little treat after his long day um and was you know now unfortunately for the democrats they have no choice but to negotiate they can't hide anymore republicans are the only ones who've done anything to lift the debt ceiling and you know most of the questions were as kind of inane as you would expect but then someone said uh why, you know, essentially, why are you negotiating with the debt ceiling at all? Is that not just a blatantly insane thing to do? And McCarthy's like, the majority of Americans, 70% of them want us to negotiate, which is like, I'd love to see the underlying data on that one. Um, you know, so 
uh, this is we can't keep wanting spending. Our children are we're going to grow up with debt. And the thing is, like, I kind of left the Capitol on Wednesday just feeling so utterly depressed because it was a whole day of Republicans doing what they always do, conflating the debt ceiling, which, as you say, is about past spending with future spending, with budget cuts, with spending cuts. And those two things have fundamentally nothing to do with each other. But it is so much easier for a Republican to say, uh, you know, I will not do a, a clean debt ceiling lift because I will not let our children grow up to shoulder debt, which again, fundamentally is nonsensical. But it's so much easier to say that than to say, no, actually, the debt ceiling is about spending that Congress has already authorized, and we just need to lift the ceiling to guarantee that money, which is, by the way, a bizarre practice that no other developed country uses. Um, and actually, the budgetary stuff is totally separate, and it's a different thing that Congress has to do at a later time. But Republicans think that they can get leverage out of this ever since 2011, when they managed to bully the Obama administration into giving them spending cuts, and now they're going to do it every single time, and they're never punished by the media for doing it, so they're going to keep doing it. It's just like, it's such... This is such a classic Republican Party thing where it is so much easier to lie pithily than to deliver these like long winded, nuanced corrections that, you know, in this case, delve into the the economic policy of our country. Let me ask you this. So one one question that I think a lot of us had going in is uh, the idea of the tension here was that the Freedom Caucus is going to demand absolutely everything they want and are you going to be able to get the moderate or just people who are in contested districts to sign on for that you know kind of far-right freedom caucus thing we know there was the thing with ethanol in mm -hmm. in iowa but it sounds like most of those people were just went along with the idea it's never going to happen so just vote for it and it'll all be fine even though as we said a moment ago i don't quite get why it's gonna all be fine but what was your feel there they they just kind of were convinced by that well i mean i think it's kind of a symptom of the larger problem plaguing the republican party which is just a, a complete inability in a, a inability to moderate at all you know and even these kind of frontliners are just going along with it hoping that people aren't paying that close of attention um i was in a scrum with don bacon while the vote was happening and he is uh from a biden district in nebraska one of these kind of new blue district republicans um and he you know he was just like we have to be realistic in our expectations we only control half the congress and not the presidency uh you know all this stuff about how you know to 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 deal with the debt ceiling, the Republicans are not going to be able to get everything they want, which, yeah, for sure, right? Like, <laughs> that is true, very astute. But it's also like, why are you voting for this? It's just, it's almost this thing of the Republican Party is so, by this point, out of practice in terms of policy, because ever since Obama, I mean, they've staked the party on saying no to everything. And it's so much easier to be in that posture than to try to actively legislate that I really think to some degree there's just some rust and some muscle fatigue and that a lot of these people are just kind of like, OK, uh, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll vote yes and not think too hard about it and hope people aren't watching that closely and hope this seemingly insane plan of McCarthy is to be like, well, now everyone's going to blame the Democrats, even though we're not lifting the debt ceiling is like right, a right. good one. I don't know, maybe based on their some kind of perception of his political savvy that is not evident to the rest of us. Yeah. OK, so so I mean, I think, you know, one of the one of the dynamics of the last eight years in this country, seven, eight years, basically since the beginning of Trump is the nothing matters political mm -hmm. framework yeah and, and that that everybody got slowly inured to over time with trump and the idea being wow this you know what i'm voting for here really seems like a killer at election time and i got to be careful but you come back to that you know what nothing matters nothing mm -hmm. matters anymore so it just there's no price there's no there's no anything and i think one of the that was what uh why the 2022 midterm seemed like such a jolt and why initially people had this idea that Trump was done 
after that, and it was going to be Ron DeSantis and all the, all these kind of things. But we do seem basically back to that at a political level, because there's no doubt no one is paying attention right now. There's no swing voters who say, hey, I saw what was in that bill. Nice try, dude. I'm never voting for you again. The point is that they're now on the record and 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 Democrats will bring that record back up in uh 16 months or however long, uh, however long it is till, uh, November, 18 months, whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. never good at math. Um, and, and so you have this kind of strange dynamic in which, uh, Kevin McCarthy is, you know, moving heaven and earth to get this done. He's so proud of himself, but what he's really done is create like a campaign document for, for Joe Biden, basically to run on in, in, in 2024, to say, oh, the Republicans uh, want to abolish this and do that and do whatever, and they all voted for it. Who were the ones who didn't vote for it? Who 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 didn't actually sign on? Is it any so any significant names, or was it actually like Freedom Caucus types who didn't didn't get enough? Mostly Freedom t- uh, Caucus types, plus. Well, I guess I don't know if Timber but, Chat is technically in it, but yeah, it all ended up being kind of like far, like Bacon and Mace, and yeah. So even they the people went along. who the Midwestern right, so he, contingent went along, yeah. Right, right. Okay, so so the I so Kevin McCarthy's idea here is that now this puts all the onus onto Joe Biden. They've said what they want, and now Joe Biden has to say what he wants now. <laughs> There's a lot of question about how that unfolds, but what is the next step here? How do how do people? What is the consensus about what happens now that this is passed, or is there no consensus? Yeah, so you know, we did a tour yesterday on the Senate side, just kind of talking to uh, Senate Democrats about this McCarthy contention that you know this is a, a a good faith negotiating effort. Now it's on to Democrats, and they were all you know it was funny. Most of them couldn't physically contain themselves in reaction, like you know, many snorts and cries of derision and such. But obviously, this bill would like repeal the major legislative achievement of the last term. Uh, it would add work requirements to benefit programs, and it would fundamentally weaken federal agencies. So this is not going to be any kind of a starting point. But McCarthy keeps saying on the record, we are not going to pass a clean spending, a clean debt ceiling hike or extension. Democrats are on the record saying they will only pass a clean hike or extension. And now the thing that is so frustrating here is like, yeah, this is a huge freaking problem. And we're coming up to a massively catastrophic impasse. But that is getting churned into coverage that's like, now it's Biden's turn to come to the negotiating table. White House has no choice but to talk to Kevin McCarthy, blah, blah, blah. And as to next steps, I mean, I don't know what they could be because Democrats are just simply have learned from the mistakes of 2011. They are not going to come to McCarthy hat in hand and say, because you're willing to be so egregiously irresponsible, let us give you some stuff that you want that you would never be able to get through regular legislative order. I mean, they're just not going to do that. And I think they would take the gamble that in the worst case scenario, Republicans are going to take the heat for this because that's what's happened in the past when Republicans try to do this kind of leveragey stuff, you know, around government shutdowns and everything. They always take the gamble that, you know, the Democratic president is the one who will be blamed. But we keep seeing that that's not what happens. Like people are at least smart enough to realize who is directly causing the problem here. Um But, you know, to some degree, I think the next steps will probably be kicking the can down the road for a while because the Treasury can basically rummage for coins between couch cushions until some point this summer. uh, The the X state is, is inching up. Early summer is what it's looking like more now, even though it used to be kind of July to September. I assume at some point Democrats are going to pass or try to pass um, like a clean debt limit hike or extension in the Senate. And what will be interesting about that is where Senate Republicans are going to come down on this is still somewhat in question. Um, There's a little bit less of such the 
dramatic break off between the chambers that there used to be, because while the party kind of marches right, Senate Republicans are moving to the right as well. But they still tend to be, you know, less insane than House Republicans. And there are still some Senate Republicans who are, um, you know, kind of rational people who will not want to torch the entire economy. So perhaps if some kind of bill can be hammered out on the Senate side, the House will have no choice but to pass it. But I don't know because, you know, McCarthy is a very weak speaker and in the thrall of the right wing element of his party. And I don't think we're exactly in a great position when we're waiting for Matt Gates to like sign off on legislation to avert catastrophe. Um, yeah. Now so. with the Senate is what is, what are the procedural rules in the Senate? Do they need 60 votes? Can they do it with yeah. 50 votes? They do need 60 votes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do. So they, they would need Republicans to, to come along to to do some kind of debt ceiling. Yeah, that's my understanding. So I guess they are but but they are really it's 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 kind of the same difference. Um so I I think we have it it would seem now if it, if if really it is early summer we're talking about late May, June, you know, that's that is as soon as four weeks is, you know, as long as eight weeks. And I guess one, I mean, it's no way to run a country, but I guess one sort of wild card here is it will like, it could be impacted significantly by initial IRS receipts mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. from April 15th or April 18th this year. You know, if they, I mean, every year you get tax receipts uh, you don't know exactly how much you're going to get. You don't know exactly how much you are going to get right at the beginning or things come in a little late. And and this could, you know, this, this could have a, a, a pretty big impact. And I don't, you know, we don't, uh, we don't know how this is going to come out. And I do think what makes this extremely dangerous is that uh, certainly doesn't seem like it certainly seems highly convincing that the Freedom Caucus crew in the House is totally ready to drive off that cliff. Mm -hmm. And Democrats have have are in a, you know, fool me once, fool me twice kind of situation here. And you can womp womp about Democrats and everything. But this is considered a basically cardinal level of of the sort of the, for lack of a better word, Democratic governing class of the last 20 years, that we are never going to do that thing that we did in 2011 again, that we we learned our lesson there. And uh, I do think that um, a critical number of Democrats are going to be willing to say, we're not going to blink. And either you guys are going to blink or we're going to have something really bad happen because we are not going to be governed by your terrorism. Now, another wild card there is that there are conceivably options for the executive branch to resort to extraordinary measures and not have not actually um, go over that cliff. And if you if our listeners remember or if you know if you visit the site uh, six weeks ago or something like that, I did a, a TPM uh, newsmaker briefing with Paul Krugman. And he said something interesting. He said that the people he talks to, which are the people you, you know, relevant people, that the assumption is, is that when it really, really, really comes down to it, that is what the Biden administration is going to do, that they are going to resort to one of these things. And I actually found that kind of surprising. Now, they are, they are never going to admit it publicly because they are trying to avoid that and trying to get the Republicans to blink. And I don't know, I have no idea if that is actually how it's going to shake out, but I was struck that he did say that. Um, so you just have all of these, all of these unknowns sort of flying together on a collision course and you and, don't know what's going to happen when they collide. And you're talking about things like prioritization in terms of what? No, 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 no I'm not. I'm, I'm talking about, uh, 
there are, I am talking about, there are a series of different things. I'm not talking about uh, 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 minting a platinum coin. I'm talking about things ranging from saying that the debt limit law itself is unconstitutional Mm -hmm. and we are going to continue authorizing debt. There are um, other ways, and I can't remember the technical the technical terms for this, but it's actually something that the Bank of England used to do. Uh, you can issue debt with no nominal value. Um, again, I'm just going to kind of talk about this in vague layman's terms. So assume I'm getting some detail wrong, but the, the, the gist is, 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 is correct, that you can issue debt that does not increase the national debt of the United States. Ergo, does not violate the debt ceiling because it doesn't increase the national debt. And um, how this works is uh, basically that you issue debt that is not redeemable. So it's it has no face value, you know, but it pays you X every year from now till the end of time or something like that. Mm-hmm. So basically there are um, there are things ranging from constitutional arguments to, uh, you know, very crafty ways of raising money for the U.S. government that uh, the Biden administration could do. And I think now um, one thing that uh, one obvious response is, well, won't, you know, Jim Jordan go directly to the Supreme Court and say, you can't do this. Probably. But I think some of the bet is that is the is the Supreme Court really going to want to issue a decision that will force the, the United States government into default? That's a big decision. That's a big decision. Um, so there are there are these things out there and I and I do not um I lack the the you know the technical knowledge and well I definitely lack the technical knowledge the legal knowledge is I am not sure anybody really knows it cuz it really comes down to a political question for the Supreme Court like are you re- are you really going to hand down a decision that forces the United States into bankruptcy and I think the White House would be figuring they're not gonna. They're not gonna have the guts to to do that. Um, so that's another that's another wild card here that you need to keep in mind. One other wrinkle I want to just mention real quick before you wrap is that, you know, we have been talking about how it'll probably you know it goes to the Senate now, and and a big question is where Senate Republicans fall on this um, because they tend to be a little more sane than their House counterparts, but you know as the party marches towards the right, it all goes towards the right. And a piece of this is, you know, when debt ceiling stuff has come up before, we've talked about reconciliation. Um, specifically, we've talked about that you could hike the, te- the debt ceiling so high via reconciliation that you would never have to worry about this again. Um, but if that does become kind of the route that the Senate has to take, perhaps because of Republican unwillingness to help, brings us back to Diane Feinstein, doesn't it? Because her absence would mean that it would rely on Manchin to pass the reconciliation package. And does anyone in the entire world have any faith that Manchin would not bite the Republican just lies about the debt ceiling, increasing our debt hook, line and sinker, especially now that he's presumably running for reelection? Yeah, it, it is a it is an absurd situation that she has placed the country in her party in. And you can say that with all the sympathy for her situation, but we ask a lot of government officials, even 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 when they do things that may be personally very hard for them. But it's not about her; it's not about them. Uh, and you know the <laughs> the good thing about Joe Manchin is you know you are going to see him being a, a kind of a raging asshole to Democrats for uh, the next. 16 months, 18 months, whatever it is, but 
you can be happy in the background because that means he's trying to get reelected right. as a Democrat. And you want him to be reelected as a Democrat because if he is not reelected, the prospects of the Democrats maintaining control of the Senate gets starts to look fairly heroic. Um, so, you know, I, I think you just have to uh, uh, accept that he cannot be he cannot be helpful for the <laughs> for the for uh, for the rest of 2023 and 2024. And that's just that's just how it is, because he's running a really Republican state. Um, and it is possible that he won't be able to be reelected even on an asshole platform. And that's <laughs> just, you know, so when you see him being an asshole, you say, Joe, go for it, dude. We you support know, we, you, baby. Yeah, we, we're with you. <laughs> we're, we're behind you 100 percent. But it certainly would be would be nice to have a a a senator from California who is who is not currently living in California. Because, yes, you represent California, but you cannot be in California full time and be representing California in the federal Senate. So it is uh, it's a it's a dangerous situation. But again, I, I think, uh, you know, it might be better in some ways for the for the. I, I, I was going to say the global economy, but but. I don't think Democrats are going to back down here. It's too foundational to their experience of the last the last two decades. It 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 just is. And um, one thing I do wonder about, and this is another thing to keep an eye on, what I think is possible is you know maybe some people in the Senate get together and you pass some. A few cuts here and there, enough to kind of a fig leaf, right? Um, uh, I th I think you could get um, you could probably make that work on the Democratic side if it were pretty fig leafy, right? Mm -hmm. And the things that might count there are, you know, there's a there's a lot of COVID aid that has not been spent yet. Um, it's it's not going to be spent for covid um probably not you know most states are just using it for random stuff so it would have uh it would likely have some negative impacts but that is something that for better or worse i think you could get some democrats to say look we got to get past this but you're not they are not going to say okay kevin what do we need to do right. I, I just i think i think they will let it go over the cliff because they're just done with that I think COVID aid, I think maybe like standing up some kind of toothless committee to study Medicaid, uh, Medicare solvency or something like that. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I, I totally agree. And um, I also think that it, even in this scenario, even if Senate Democrats are like, okay, sure, we'll like pass your crazy House Republican bill, that would only extend the debt ceiling until March 2024 at the furthest. Like, in probably because it's either when you hit uh, 1.5 trillion or March 2024. So, you know, I, even in the like dream Republican scenario, Repo Democrats would still have to accept the fact that they will have to do this whole. Yeah, they want to do it. They want to do it once once a year, hostage taking every right year. Yeah. The 2024 election. So, I mean, no, I totally agree with you. I think Democrats have learned on this issue. I think they're not going to reward Republicans for continuing to play this game of chicken. And that makes the situation more dangerous for sure. But also you can't keep rewarding Republicans for playing with matches. You just can't. You, you can't negotiate with terrorists. Yep. That's what it comes down to. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we've right. covered the outlines. Hope you enjoyed this Instapod version of the Josh Marshall podcast. Uh, remember, the Josh Marshall podcast brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. You can get 25% off at great, on any order at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. And we will be back uh, next week for the regularly scheduled uh, episode of the Josh Marshall podcast. All right. See you then. Later. The Josh Marshall Podcast is hosted by me, TPM reporter Kate Riga, and TPM founder, editor-in-chief Josh Marshall. The show is produced by Jackie Wendell. Thanks to Why Not Jan Spell for our podcast theme song. And 
thanks to all our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen.